The text for this morning is the uh, gospel lesson, the parable of the landowner who planted a vineyard. My brothers and sisters in Christ, have you ever noticed that in this world of sin, nothing comes to us as pure good or pure evil? At least, nothing in this world. Riches are good, but uh, people prey on the rich, and thieves steal from the rich. Then there are taxes and charities, and you have to be concerned where you put the money because it doesn't, so that it doesn't cost you more than it makes while you preserve your riches for future use. As soon as you get that thing that you have desired so long, you have to start upkeep, storage and oftentimes repair. Hope and I own a two-story house with a large yard, but now it is our responsibility to keep it beautiful and in good repair. There's the continual yard work, repairs to plumbing, cleaning, and even trapping mice in the second-story house. How they get up there, we don't know, but it is. Good, but always tinged with some trouble in trouble of some sort. Even knowledge of faith needs to be tended. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. And if God has given it to you, faith or knowledge or whatever it is, you can be sure that, it gave, that He gave it to you for a purpose. God intends for you to use it. That's what stewardship is about using what God has entrusted to you for His purposes. You have health and strength. How can you use it to serve Him and bring glory to God? You have knowledge and faith. How can you use them to His glory and the edification of the church? You have riches. You have unique abilities. You have spare time and energy to focus and desire to be involved in something. How can you manage these things to the welfare of the body of Christ and glory of God and the joyous task of bringing the lost and erring to Christ are accomplished? These are the questions which confront every child of God. What purpose has God given us? Why has God given us this great good? Our theme this morning is unexpected good, unexpected trouble. The parable of the vineyard and the wicked tent is about the Jews. Jesus teaches them that they have proved unworthy in their place in the vineyard of God. He describes the rejection, the beating, and ultimately the killing of the prophets. He prophesied that they will be uh, killing the, the son. And although he doesn't tell them that it's a prophecy, you just know it because of our advantage in history. Then Jesus asks them to judge themselves and their history as a people in the privileged position of the chosen people of God. He asks them to judge on the basis of the parable, not knowing that the conclusion about the be pronounced, uh, not knowing the conclusion about to be pronounced. And uh, uh, they could see it clearly and said, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and end and rent out the vineyard to other tents. We'll pay him the proceeds in the proper season. And Jesus unfolds the parable to the Jews. He tells them what it meant and what their judgment meant, and what the judgment uh, that the judgment agrees with God. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, and given to a nation, producing the fruit of it. That was the unexpected trouble. They were the possessors of the kingdom, and the word, and the, of the favor of God. But they rejected God and His purposes for them and with all that He had blessed them. 
They wanted it all for themselves. And they wanted it uh, all their way. And they wanted it for their own sinful and oh so temporary purposes. God ultimately said, no. Jesus said, did you re never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous now. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God is taken away from you and given to a nation producing its fruits. Now, we are that nation that Jesus is speaking about. We are the new people. We're not, not America, but us Christians. The church the body of Christ, we are the ones that Peter often referred to by, in the inspiration of the Scripture, or the Holy Spirit. By you, you are a chosen priest, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The unexpected good, at least from the perspective of history, is that we are given the grace of God and salvation. Jesus took your sins to the cross. He freely forgives you when you turn in repentance to Him. He pours out resurrection from the grave and eternal life to all, without reference to race, gender, or denominational titles. It's a gift which is received and possessed by all who know it and trust in God to do what he has promised, to do for the sake of the death and resurrection of Christ. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. What an unexpected good. It's unexpected because it's undeserved. It is grace. God's good gifts for God's own reasons. Now that we have such riches, what do we want to do with them? The answer to that question is, what does God want us to do with them? Why did God give them to us, and for what place in his purpose? Did God pour out his grace upon us for no other reason that we should find eternal life? Uh, Jesus indicated that he will give his kingdom to others who will produce the fruits of it. So we need to consider the fruits of the kingdom. What are they? How do we go about producing them? And what happens if we do not? The answer is that the fruits of the kingdom of God are faith, hope, love, mercy, truth, Righteousness and peace. Drawing from Scripture, I'm sure we could compile a list twice as long as that. But these are the fruits that God desires. Because these are the fruits God creates in those who are His and works through them. These are the fruits that the Jews did not produce. Faith is the first fruit. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the Word of God. God reaches into each one of us each time we hear, hear the Word preached to create faith. And where He's already at work to sustain and strengthen faith. We can't work that faith by our own or our will or our power. But we can work against it or choose to walk away from it. Our part in this fruit of faith is to do what God shows us that is beneficial for our life of faith. We should eagerly and humbly hear the Word of God and believe it with all the power God gives us to cling to His Word. Hope proceeds from faith. Trusting in God and knowing His heart towards us, we hope. The New Testament word hope does not mean that weak and deceptive thing we refer to when we say 
uh, use the word in uh, casual conversation. Like saying, I hope the Ravens will win this week against Washington. That's hope is more, more wishful thinking. But the hope of the Christian in faith is a firm confidence in something real, something already possessed, and yet not fully experienced. I hope in eternal life through Jesus Christ. The Bible instructs me that I already possess it, but I do not sense it. I see death and decay instead especially in these times of COVID and the anarchist events. So I hope, that is, I cling to the reality that which I can't see or feel, but of which God has assured me through his word. Love flows from faith and hope. It too is the gift of God. His Holy Spirit works this love in me. My flesh, burdened by sin, always resists it and chafes against this holy love. But God is at work in me. And I daily know full well that He has a tough task in me. He is working in each one of you who believes to create in us this holy passion which forgives the sins of others as we have been forgiven and seeks only the welfare and blessing of the brother and, or sister in the family of God. Mercy also echoes the grace of God. We take pity on those who have not become the Christ. We share one another's burdens. So fulfill the law of Christ, as the Bible says in Galatians. This is not a proof of the kingdom of God. But that kingdom is grounded in truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He also calls God's word truth. We who live and by and through the faith, truth must also live in and from it. We cannot lie to each other. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, Truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And we also must walk in the truth of his words, sound doctrine. Righteousness is yet another proof who claim righteousness from the king of righteousness. We have been made holy people. Holy people do holy works. The Bible tells us. That God is at work in us to desire and to do His good will. Having been set free from sin, we are no longer slaves of it or make ourselves slaves of it, but live to righteously and bend every effort to hear and obey the urgings of the Spirit within us to be God's holy people. And finally, there is peace. Peace comes from knowing the truth and believing it and being comforted in the hope, enjoying the love of one another and seeing the evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives of righteousness and our desires to live out the, our lives in holiness, which is his gift to us and which our flesh so rages against. Every fruit of the kingdom is God's gift of grace through faith. It's that unexpected good. Not that we don't know it's coming, for God's word tells us that it's coming. Not that we don't, uh, let's see. But we also know that we don't deserve the gift. Therefore, it is an unexpected good, which is ours at least in part because of the unexpected trouble of the Jews. They never thought they could go so far that God would not simply follow. The 
their unexpected trouble has made even more clear our unexpected but wonderful good. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.